Okay, our final talk for the session is Annalise Paby. Thank you. So thanks to the organizers and thanks for all of you for sticking around. I'll try and make this snappy. So I want to tell you about a project that began when I was a postdoc with Matt Rockman at New York University and continues now in my new lab at Georgia Tech. And in this project, we discovered functional genetic variation uh, in gene networks for embryogenesis in C. elegans. But this variation is hard to see uh, because it's cryptic. So if we consider the full spectrum of all natural genetic variation, we can acknowledge that there are some alleles that never affect phenotype under any conditions. They're universally silent. Some alleles that always affect phenotype in the exact same way, they're universally penetrant. And then we can acknowledge that there are some alleles that um, rely on dominance or recessivity, some alleles um, that have gene-by-gene -gene interactions or epistasis or gene-by-environment interactions. And so cryptic genetic variation is down here. It's really a subclass of the alleles that exhibit epistasis or gene-by-environment interaction with the caveat that in order for a cryptic allele to penetrate to phenotype, something has to happen. The system has to be perturbed, like a new mutation coming into a genome or population or a change in the environment. So cryptic genetic variation is just natural genetic variation that has the potential to affect phenotype under rare conditions. Oh, I'm ahead of myself. So we were interested in screening for cryptic variation in embryogenesis, uh, in C. elegans. So this is the scheme that we used to look for it. So if you consider a wild-type strain of worm, adults, they lay a lot of embryos. And because embryogenesis is a really robust process, they virtually all hatch into larvae. And if we look across different wild-type strains, we see the exact same thing. There's no phenotypic variation in the success of these embryos hatching into larvae because they all do it just fine. But this is a model system. We know a lot about the genes that are required for embryogenesis. So we targeted them one by one uh, to turn them off using RNA interference. So again, the adults, they lay a lot of embryos, but now a proportion of them are dead. So this proportion is very consistent within each genetic strain, but quite variable across strains. So now this phenotypic variation is evidence of cryptic variation. It's, it's not due to nucleotide variation at the loci that we're targeting by RNAi, but rather due to cryptic unknown alleles elsewhere in the genomes that are interacting with it. <coughs> so I'm not really going to talk about our methods, but um, one thing that I will mention is that it was very important that we do this at very high throughput in order to have the statistical power uh, to look for these effects. And so ultimately, we conducted all of this in liquid culture uh, in 96 well plates. And the phenotype that I'm describing is really just um, embryonic lethality, the proportion of offspring that died. Uh, and we estimated embryonic lethality using a computer algorithm, algorithm developed by Amelia White, a graduate student at NYU, that essentially classified objects within our 96 wells as embryos or larvae or adults. And so I'm going to tell you results here that have to do with 29 embryonic genes that we targeted, and we looked across a total of 55 wild-type worm strains. So the first question, is there cryptic variation in this system? And of course, the answer is yes, there's a lot. So this plot represents all of the data all at once. If you look uh, at this heat map, you'll notice that the strains are in rows, the genes that we targeted are in columns, and every cell in this heat map, if it's red, it uh, was like high embryonic lethality, yellow is high hatching. So one of the first things that you'll notice is that if you just compare across columns, you can see that some genes were just a lot more lethal than others. Okay, we expected this. So in the statistical analysis, we had a highly significant gene effect. But of course, we, you can also see that if you compare across rows, we had a highly significant strain effect. Some strains, in fact, didn't seem to die at all. And this is due almost entirely, we believe, because there are very clearly genetic heritable differences in how well the RNAi works in these different strains. So this is also significant. But of course, the component of variation that we're interested in is that which represents cryptic genetic variation. And in our model, that's the strain by gene interaction term, which I will tell you was very highly significant, and in fact explained about as much of the variation, about 16%, as did that strain effect. But you can't really see this 
Oh, <laughs> yes, I was happy to. <laughs> uh, you can't really see that um, on this plot, so I'm going to show you a subset of these data plotted another way. So here is one strain in green um, and the hatching phenotypes for it on the seven genes that comprise the, uh, the polarity pathway that establishes the anterior posterior poles uh, in the early embryo. And so we hypothesized that, well, these different strains, maybe some of them are just going to be more vulnerable to having this polarity pathway perturbed than others. But that's really not what we see, because then if I plot the results for a strain in blue, you can see that one strain isn't really more vulnerable than other. It's kind of specific to the gene that's targeted. So we, we, you know, we try and knock down PAR3, and you can see the green strain has higher hatching, knock down PAR4, the blue strain has higher hatching. And if I plot all of the data for the 12 strains that were highly and similarly sensitive to RNAi as the laboratory strain N2, what you see is there's a lot of variation here, but it's very specific to the gene that's perturbed. There's a lot of crossing of reaction norms, which is a sort of visual example of that strain by gene interaction term that was so significant in our statistical analysis. And this is a very common pattern that we observe in many ways in our data. And we interpret this as evidence of low pleiotropy in the genetic architecture of these cryptic alleles because we don't know what they're doing, but whatever they're doing, it must be sort of so singular that they're interacting with very few genetic partners because it takes a very specific gene perturbation to uncover them. So some of the gene perturbations revealed more cryptic variation than others, which is what is represented on the y-axis here. And for these cryptic phenotypes, one of the questions that we had was, are there many cryptic alleles contributing to it of small effect or a few of large? The answer is, for the majority of these cryptic phenotypes, all of which, all of these genes revealed significant cryptic variation. The answer is mostly many alleles of small effect. And the reason that we know that is we estimated genomic heritability using estimates of relatedness across the strains from about 40,000 SNP genotype data. And we got, for the most part, very high estimates of heritability. And that can only be explained by high polygenicity because that's what's best captured uh, by relatedness. But in a few cases, we got estimates of zero. So for these phenotypes, we think there are probably a few major uh, alleles. So can we map them? Maybe. Um, so this is a cartoon of the six chromosomes of C. elegans. And uh, so we targeted 29 genes. We had 29 sort of phenotypes. Uh, we performed 20, 29 association tests. 15 of them identified at least one significant SNP under some threshold or another. And the most important thing about this is very few of these significant SNPs were shared across different cryptic phenotypes. And indeed, um, there was almost no enrichment of p-values across these different tests. This is, again, more evidence for low pleiotropy. So here are two of the results from our genome-wide association tests. We targeted a gene called LAUC22 and then one called PKC3. Both identified significant SNPs on the right arm of chromosome 2. These are different. We, it looks like they're pointing to different cryptic alleles, but they're roughly in the same area, so we thought we'd kill two birds with one stone. So we identified two strains here in blue and green um, that each have alternate hatching phenotypes on both LAUC22 and PKC3. So we created an introgression strain where we took that chunk from the right arm of chromosome 2 from the blue strain and we put it into the green strain. And then we asked, well, does that introgression rescue the blue phenotype? And in both cases, it does. So it validates at least this part of our genome-wide association analysis. But this is a really big chunk. So we wanted to fine map it. So we created near isogenic lines. So we had sort of a series of lines that had ever smaller chunks of that region on chromosome 2 knock down LAUC22, and the phenotype totally decomposes. So we interpret this as, well, there's probably many cryptic alleles segregating in this region. Okay, fine. We do the same thing for PKC3. We narrow it down. I created another set of near isogenic lines, narrowed it down again. In the third set of isogenic lines, it sort of falls apart, but at least we got down to a megabase. Okay, fine. So now uh, we tried another thing where we, we sort of did standard QTL mapping using recombinant inbred lines. These were actually generated by... Um, my colleague Patrick McGrath um, at uh, Georgia Tech. Doesn't work. We tried it for not just LAUC22 and PKC3, but a num number of other cryptic phenotypes. OK, so I am trying an entirely new thing. We are not doing any more mapping, at least not for the time being. And so it's been argued 
that maybe the alleles that are most important for phenotypic variation, and in fact, uh, the phenotypic variation that is probably most important for complex trait evolution, are just not accessible to us. And you may not be surprised that I am a disciple of this argument. <laughs> we can talk later. <laughs> because um, math's not here. So what, what, what we are doing now is we want to take advantage of the fact that we're working in C. elegans, right? And I, I think it's quite possible that C. elegans embryogenesis is actually the best characterized metazoan process. We know the critical genes that govern this process. We know the cell biological events on a very sort of like specific scale that uh, mediate these processes. So we want to leverage that and ask sort of some of the same questions. How does this complex uh, process vary? And why does it vary? Because ultimately, we're interested in questions of how these sort of complex processes that are so critical and so important can diverge so much over evolutionary time, which we certainly know they do quite a bit in nematodes. So there's a lot of vignettes that I could tell you um, about why we're pursuing this, but I want to give you one motivation. Um, so. Um, the establishment of the anterior pole in the early C. elegans embryo was characterized genetically for the most part by Ken Kempfes in the 1990s, um, but understanding cell polarity using the C. elegans embryo as a model is still a really major source of on ongoing research in C. elegans community. But we know that there are three major factors that are important for establishing the anterior pole. So PAR3, PAR6, and PKC3. So these proteins, they physically interact with each other, they co-localize. Uh, if you knock them out, they show very similar mutant phenotypes, things like mislocalization of other proteins and misorientation of the AB spindle. And when we knocked down these three genes uh, in the laboratory wild type strain N2, we saw the same thing that had been published before. They, they cause a lot, of embryon a lot of embryonic lethality and similar embryonic lethality across the three perturbations in the N2 wild type strain. But what we also saw is that when we look at these three perturbations across different wild type strains, we see a lot of variation. So since this system was entirely characterized in the N2 wild type strain, it begs the question, what is really going on in terms of the fine um, molecular cellular events that establish polarity in this system? So we are phenotyping this at high throughput in our, in our embryos. And one process that I'm pretty excited about is the ability to get incredibly precise counts of transcripts in the early embryo at incredibly accurate stages of the embryo using single molecule fish. And I think this is a cool method because the, the thing that you're counting, which is the dots up here in an image like this, is literally the exact thing you want to know, which is exactly how many transcripts are in those cells at that precise point in time. And so, of course, there is highly significant variation across different wild type strains under the control conditions. But what we can also do is we can count these transcripts um, not only in the control condition, but also after we try and shut down genes using RNAi. So here in this particular case, on the top is one strain, the wild type uh, laboratory strain N2. And if you compare it to this other wild type strain, these y axes are actually the same. So you can see that um, N2 actually has a native, slightly elevated number of uh, transcript abundance compared to the other strain. But most importantly, when we knock down this target um, using RNAi, you can see that it gets knocked down in N2, but not nearly as much as it does in the other wild type strain. So, of course, we're very interested in this genetic basis of germline um, variation in RNAi. So this is one method that we are using to explore that. Okay, this is it. So in summary, um, there's a lot of genetic variation in this system that's functional but hard to see. Um, it's cryptic variation, it's modifier variation, it's genetic background variation, it's epistasis, however you want to talk about it. Uh, it looks like this variation has low pleiotropy and that it is highly polygenic with relatively small effects. So really, we're looking at heritable differences in network function in this system. And so to understand this better, um, we're taking advantage of the fact that we know a lot about cell biological processes in this system because it's a model system. And we're trying to implement high throughput quantitation um, of lots of different phenotypes and combine it with classical quantitative genetic analyses to try and understand how such a complex system can both be um, robust and variable at the same time. And really, we're motivated because we want to better characterize epistasis in this system, which we can see is rampant. And also, we want to eventually assess how these complex traits can evolve over time because we certainly know that they are highly variable across taxa. Uh, in nematodes. 
So I would definitely want to thank Matt Rockman, my postdoc advisor, and also Fabio Piano and Chris Gonzalez, who were very important mentors to me at, at NYU, and members of their lab who were collaborators on this project. Uh, and in particular, I also want to thank Han Ding Chao, my postdoc at Georgia Tech, who is uh, going gangbusters on the single molecule fish project. So thank you. Okay, I'd just like to uh, once again thank the speakers for another outstanding session.